Welcome back to the final part of Lecture 11. In the first part of Lecture 11, we looked at pipe flow. We looked at how to develop a friction factor expression and found that it's implicit. We also looked at the transition between laminar flow and turbulent flow, and we illustrated both of those concepts by means of a worked example. Now we're going to turn our attention to that other rheometrically important geometry, that of the couette. We've seen the couette before. We've done analysis for the couette cell in a Newtonian flow and also an analysis in power law. So we're going to follow that same workflow that we've established where we have an intermediate result and then a final result. And we're going to illustrate that workflow now in terms of a Bingham fluid. Now, if we think about viscoplastic fluids in general in flow, we know that certain flow scenarios can give us an entirely yielded flow or an entirely unyielded flow, in which case it doesn't become a flow scenario because everything's solid, or a mixed regime flow where we have the presence of both yielded and unyielded material. And so when we look at the couette, we have to bear this in mind and we have to be a little bit careful. So we're going to outline that four cases actually exist for the type of flow that we get in the couette. In this part of the lecture, we're only going to examine one of those cases, which is going to be for where all the flow is yielded and we will then establish next lecture what the other cases will be. So let's start by reminding ourselves what the couette cell looks like. So here on the board is a schematic diagram of a couette cell that you've seen a number of times before. Remember that a couette is a solid inner cylinder inside a hollow outer cylinder and the fluid of interest goes in the gap between these two cylinders. We're electing in our example to rotate the inner cylinder and to hold the outer cylinder stationary. And experimentally, we set an angular velocity and we measure a torque. So torque is an important experimental result. And remember that torque is related to the shear stress that presents itself on the outer surface of that inner cylinder. So tau r theta refers to the inner cylinder and it's a shear stress on the radial face in the theta direction, the rotation direction. Stress times area gives us a force, force times lever arm gives us a torque, hence we end up with this torque expression. Now, remember that the general workflow that we developed was to establish an expression for torque, relate via a constitutive law what the stress equality to strain rate is, and we pluck out from the strain rate tense of the relevant terms, and for a couette cell, the relevant term is my strain rate is minus r d omega by dr. So this workflow would apply for any rotational geometry. The torque expression would be a little bit different. We've seen torque expressions for parallel plates and for Conan plates, and we could develop an analogous workflow for that. So let's do this now in the context of my Bingham fluid. So there is the workflow on the board again, but the middle component has changed because I've inserted the Bingham constitutive equation. So we know that my tau r theta is equal to tau y plus mu b gamma dot. So I'm going to insert the expression for my shear rate gamma dot, and I'm going to rearrange the Bingham expression such that the subject is gamma dot, and then we're going to write the integral that drops out of that. So there on the board now, on the right hand side is the rearranged version of the Bingham equation. If we rearrange it such that gamma dot is a subject, we end up with tau minus tau y over mu b. That's in the terms on the right hand side. And on the left hand side, we simply have the integral of the angular velocity omega. Let's pause for a second and think what the flow in the couette might look like. Let's introduce some cases. So case one, we can imagine a flow scenario where all the fluid is sheared. There isn't a symmetry line in a couette like there is in a pipe. And so therefore we can have shy high shear rate across that entire gap, which means that the stress developed in that entire gap is above the yield stress. So all our fluid could be sheared. Now, the second case is a limiting case of the first case, because we can still have all the fluid to be sheared, but only just insofar as that on the outer wall, we just have the yield stress. So it's a limiting case. 
Now, it can get a little more complex because the yield could occur somewhere in the gap. Somewhere close to the inner cylinder, where the shear rate is highest, we could have a yielded zone. And somewhere close to the outer cylinder, where the shear rates are low because, hey, it's stationary, there could be unyielded material. Finally, we could have another limiting case, which is just where the material is yielding at the inner wall, where flow is just incipiently starting in the entire Kuwait system. We're going to focus on case one for now. We'll cover cases two through four next lecture. So, if our fluid in the gap is yielded everywhere, that means everywhere the shear stress tau has to be greater than tau y. OK, fine. So, if we think about the relationship between torque, big gamma, and shear stress tau, we can say that gamma over 2 pi L r naught squared, r naught is the radius of my outer cylinder, is greater than or equal to tau y. That group of terms in yellow involving torque is just the torque expression rearranged for shear stress. And so all this is saying is my shear stress is greater than my yield stress, but rearranging it in terms of the experimental measurement that I take. If we think about what that actually means, if the group of terms in yellow equal tau y, that would be the minimum torque required to fully yield the material. And so that gives us a minimum torque criteria. We will use this minimum torque criteria in the analysis that follows, because we want everything to be yield everywhere, so we need to exceed the minimum torque criteria. OK, here's a reminder of the integral that we've developed. It's for a Kuwait cell in terms of a Bingham fluid. Look at the integration limits, and we're going to start integrating by assuming that the lower limit of angular velocity is the angular velocity of the inner cylinder. That corresponds to a radius ri, the radius of the inner cylinder. And we're going to go out all the way to the outer cylinder, where r equals r naught. Of course, the outer cylinder is stationary, so at that point, my angular velocity is 0. So let's integrate. We are going to integrate, first of all, by substituting my term for torque, because don't forget that torque, arbitrary torque, is a function of radius. And so we need to include that within the integral. OK, so the result that I get is for the angular velocity at the inner cylinder is equal to a group of terms including torque, another group of terms involving geometry, 1 over ri squared minus 1 over r naught squared. This result might look a bit familiar. And then a group of terms involving yield stress. So let's compare this result to what we've seen before. Now on the board is the result that we've just derived, but coloured in such a way that I can compare it directly to the Newtonian result. Now, the terms in orange are Newtonian terms. The terms in blue are those new terms due to the yield stress. And so we can see if my yield stress falls to zero, then all I'm left with is the Newtonian result. So this is my sanity check, and I'm happy with that because that's entirely what we would expect. If tau y equals zero, the yield component of Bingham has gone, which leaves just the Newtonian component left. So that's a good result. It means that our maths is right. So let's have a look, much as we did in pipe flow, at the ratio between the apparent viscosity and the Newtonian viscosity. And if we divide these two terms together, we can see that the ratio of the Bingham viscosity to the Newtonian viscosity, mu b over mu, has a 1, and then minus a group of terms involving 1 over gamma. So what this means is that as the torque in the Kuwait system gets higher and higher and higher and higher, 1 over gamma gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Therefore, that second group of terms on the right-hand side disappears. Then we're left with mu b is effectively equal to mu. So it's the Newtonian result, which is exactly what we saw in pipe flow at high shear rates. So again, everything is consistent. Now, if you remember the workflow for previous lectures for the Kuwait, we integrated between the inner cylinder and the outer cylinder, got an intermediate result. 
then integrate it again between the inner cylinder and an arbitrary point in the flow, because we want to work out a profile. Use that intermediate result to simplify the solution, and hey presto, we had an expression for V theta as a function of R. We're going to do exactly the same here. I've replaced the limits on my integral here, this is the integral we saw previously, with arbitrary limits little a and little b and big A and big B and all we're going to do is just set those limits to the two limits sets that we require for our workflow. So here's the integral that we've already done from the inner cylinder to the outer cylinder ri to r0 which corresponds to an angular velocity of omega i through to 0 because the outer cylinder is stationary and there's the result that we achieved previously. That's my intermediate result. Now I'm going to change my limits, and so I'm integrating from the inner cylinder to an arbitrary point in the flow, little r, which means, in angular velocity terms, I'm going from the angular velocity of the inner cylinder, omega i, through to an arbitrary value of omega somewhere in the flow. And I get this result here. If I subtract those two results, I end up with omega as a function of r. So I'm going to do that. Furthermore, I'm going to recognise that r omega is v theta, and therefore I have an expression for my tangential velocity, my rotational velocity v theta, as a function of rheology and geometry. So unlike the Newtonian result, which was solely a function of geometry, we have a result here that is dependent on rheology, much as the power law result when we looked at generalised Newtonian fluids was also dependent on rheology. So we now have an expression that involves mu b and tau y. So what does this mean? Let's plot non-dimensional rotational velocity, v theta over v theta max, as a function of r over ri. Remember my inner radius is going to be smaller than my outer radius, hence r over ri goes from 1 upwards and because my outer radius is double my inner radius, it simply goes from 1 to 2. I've put the dimensions and the material properties there on the board, just in case you want to recreate this graph. What I've done, first of all, is to quickly work out what my minimum torque is. And then I'm going to plot v theta over v theta max as a function of r over ri for different multiples of that minimum torque, remembering that the higher the torque gets, the closer the result approaches the Newtonian, which means that the higher the torque gets, we would expect each of these curves to come closer and closer to one another. So, at twice the minimum torque, I get this kind of relationship. At four times the minimum torque, I get a very similar relationship shifted a little bit. I'll double again and go eight times minimum torque. That's very close to four times minimum torque. So you could see that if I went to 16, 32, 64 times minimum torque, the curves would become indistinguishable from one another, which is a good demonstrator of the result that we just attained. So let's recap a few key points. In the final part of lecture 11, this part, we've looked at the Couette workflow once more. We've recognised that four different flow scenarios can happen for Bingham fluid, and we analysed the first of those four, which was fully yielded flow everywhere in the Couette gap. We derived an expression for V theta, and we found that, in common to a power law fluid, it is dependent on the rheology of the material within the gap. We also saw by analysis and by graphical examination that as the torque gets higher and higher and higher, the viscosity approaches the Newtonian viscosity, and one of the two sets of terms within the V theta expression drops effectively to being negligible.